Okay. So I'm really hoping this is still focused because I just battled with this for like an hour to try and get it to autofocus and I couldn't. So what you see is what you get. Hi, hello, I'm Sarah Capello and welcome to my channel. If you like what you see, don't forget to hit the subscribe button down below and also leave a comment if you found this story interesting. Now, before I get started, I just wanted to point out the fact that I am sick, so I do sound really nasally, and I apologize for that in advance, but the story was just way too interesting not to share with you guys. Okay, so without further ado, today's story is about Mark Twitchell. He is a 40-year-old man who is currently living in Edmonton, Alberta. So the first time that we hear about Mark Twitchell is actually when he was 21, when he met his first wife on an online dating website. Megan Castorella described him as a really sweet and intelligent, loving person um, and said that he had a really good dating profile and soon after they met, the two were actually wed. So a few years later, Castorella actually realized that Twitchell was a compulsive liar when she discovered that he was cheating on her. Um, he was making lots of different online profiles on various dating websites in order to meet different people. But what Castorella thought was weird was that he wasn't only posing as a man on these websites, he was also catfishing people as a woman as well. And she even got relatively terrified when he asked her if she had ever thought about killing anyone. He even stated that if he was going to kill anybody, it would be a homeless person because they don't have any family and nobody would really care. Shortly after the two got divorced in 2007, he remarried a woman named Jessica and they moved on to have two kids. Their relationship was going seemingly really well, uh, but he felt like something was lacking in his life and he really wanted to pursue his passion, which was for the film industry. So in 2008, he rented out a garage in Edmonton and uh, decided to pursue some of his films. So this part is a little bit confusing, so I'm going to try and say it as best as I can. Um, at this time, he made a short film about a man who had met a woman online and planned to meet her. So when he went to go and pick her up for the date, he walked into her garage and was actually attacked by a man in a hockey mask and then was robbed and murdered. At the same time, in real life, Twitchell actually began using websites such as Plenty of Fish and Tinder in order to meet new people, and this is while he was still married to Jessica. And again, he was using profiles that weren't just men, they were women as well. I just realized that my cat was behind me for the first time, and she looks adorable. So on Friday, October 3rd, 2008, a man named Jill Tetro planned to meet up with a woman that he met online named Sheena. He had met her on Plenty of Fish um, after recently going through a divorce at the age of 33, and he actually described her as being a very intelligent and smart person, and that's why he wanted to meet with her, because he felt like he would get along with her. Tetro also said that he liked the fact that Sheena was very controlling, as she had actually instructed him to come and pick her up for the date, um, and she gave him the directions to his garage. So when he arrived, he walked up to the garage like Sheena had instructed him, and instead of being met with the young woman he thought he was going to, he was actually attacked by Mark Twitchell. Now, Twitchell attacked him with a stun gun, and immediately they kind of broke into a fight, but then Twitchell announced that he had a gun. So reluctantly, Twitchell just kind of had to take a few beatings until he realized that the gun was actually plastic because Twitchell had dropped it. Now at this moment, he kind of lost a little bit of the fear that he had, and adrenaline kicked in, and he started inching him closer towards the garage because he had noticed that the door was a little bit open. So he inched closer and closer to the garage door until eventually he was able to drop down to the ground and roll outside. Uh, but unfortunately, because of the effects of the stun gun, he couldn't actually get up. So at this time, Tejo thought he had gotten lucky. There was a young couple that was walking by at the time and they saw him on the ground and he repeatedly asked for help, saying that he was being robbed. But unfortunately, the young couple thought that yes he could be telling the truth but this could also be part of a ploy in order to rob them so the couple went home and left tetro there um he was eventually able to make it back to his truck and a very stunned tetro actually drove to his home and didn't tell anybody about what happened that night because he was just scared pretty much so fast forward to the very next Friday, and John Aldinger actually met Sheena online as well. 
Um, now, he was 38, and he was a very cautious person and always kept in contact with his family. So when he planned to meet up with Sheena, he actually had sent the directions that she sent him to a buddy of his stating that he was going on a date and just wanted to make sure um, in case anything had happened, his friends knew where he was. So after that, John Aldinger was actually never heard from again, and his friends and family became increasingly worried because he was a person that had kept in contact very well, and it was kind of weird of him to kind of go off the charts, but they just figured he was busy, um, and that was until he actually missed a bike meet with his best friends, and at that point, they knew something was going on. So because they had been planning this bike trip for months, they actually reached out to Al Dinger and sent him an email just being like, hey buddy, what's up? Like, what happened? You didn't come to the bike meet and such. And they got a reply basically being very vague and stating that he was moving to Costa Rica with Sheena. Now, his friends thought this was very weird because although John was a very adventurous person, he wasn't the type to just get up and move with somebody that he had just met. They also became suspicious because he wasn't answering any of his phone calls and he had suddenly stopped showing up to work without any sort of warning. So a group of his friends actually broke into his apartment and when they got there, they realized that he had left all of his belongings behind, including his passport, which obviously he would need if he was actually moving to Costa Rica. At this point, his friends actually decided to contact the police. They feared that something had happened to John and they didn't want to wait any longer. So Detective Bill Clark was actually assigned to the case and because one of uh, his friends had received the directions from John, that's where he sort of began and he brought in Mark Twitchell for questioning. He kind of dismissed him right away though because he said that he was very open and honest with him and was actually very happy to show him around the garage um, and answer any of his questions. Twitchell even asked some questions of his own, stating that somebody had tampered with his garage door and he feared that somebody might have broken into his garage. Now, clearly, Twitchell was very convincing because Bill Clark himself said that he seemed very open and honest. He had no reason to suspect him at the time. So they kind of dismissed him and started looking for other clues. So because the police had no other leads, they actually decided to turn to the public for assistance. And this is when the young couple that had seen Tetro struggling on the previous Friday night came forward and told the police what they had witnessed. Now, the police was able to piece together that this was a completely separate incident than had happened a week before, meaning that obviously there had to be another victim, but there wasn't any other missing persons reports, so they were very confused. So again, they reached out to the public for assistance, and they began looking for this man that the young couple had pointed out, and two weeks later, finally, Jill Tetro uh, came forward and told the police what had happened, stating that he was invited to that garage and that he was attacked by a man in a hockey mask. The police obviously shifted their attention back to Twitchell and brought him in for a second interview and during this interview they had actually asked him if he had seen um, John's car which was a red Mazda 3 hatchback to which Twitchell obviously replied no he hadn't seen it at all um, and because they had no conclusive evidence they unfortunately just had to let him go. Later that night, however, Aldinger actually called in and he said that he had so conveniently purchased a red hatchback Mazda 3, um, which was actually the same make and model as John Aldinger's. So Bill Clark then realized that he had caught the guy who was responsible for John Aldinger's disappearance, but unfortunately he didn't have enough evidence to convict him of anything, so they were hoping to get a confession out of him. They brought him into the police station and tried to coax something out of him, but he didn't say anything. At the end of the interview, Bill Clark even stated, you're not going to be able to live with what you've done. And he replied back, you'll be surprised as to what I can live with. So obviously police were kind of convinced at this point that he was responsible, especially after what he had said at the end of that interview. And they got a warrant to search his house, his car, uh, his garage and his belongings. So while searching, uh, they ended up getting his laptop and they found a deleted file that was titled SK Confessions. So the Word document actually started with, this is my progression into becoming a serial killer. And he continued on to describe all of his horrific crimes that he's committed, um, including the one with Jill Tetro. And then he also moved on to describe the incident with John Aldinger. So in this document, he actually confessed to dismembering and disposing of John Aldinger's body in a true psycho-like fashion. He stated that he would sing along while he was looking for the next tools to make the next part easier for him. And at this point, police had enough evidence to charge him with first-degree murder, but they still had no idea what had happened to John Aldinger's body. 
they took him out on a drive to basically try and get him to disclose the location of the body, but Twitchell refused to tell the detectives anything and didn't want to give up the location. So only after nine months of incarceration did John Aldinger finally give up the location of the body and he gave the police a printout Google Maps version with a sewer marked where John's body parts essentially had been disposed of. So during his trial, the police actually ended up finding his short film, which he made as well. And then he represented himself, basically stating that it had all been a ploy just to get publicity for his film. He didn't actually intend to kill Aldinger until he got very physically violent with him. He actually had planned to just attack Tetro and Aldinger and release them so that they could spread the news of this hockey mask killer um, so that people would be scared. And when the movie came out, it would be sort of like a real phenomenon. He then stated that things began to go wrong when Aldinger became infuriated and started attacking him back, which at that point he ended up killing him. He claimed that the document the police found titled SK Confessions wasn't actually true, but it was a pure fabrication. Um, But the jury fortunately saw through all of his lies and basically after only three hours of deliberation, they decided that they were going to convict him for first degree murder. Mark Twitchell was then sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for 25 years, and he's actually serving his sentence at the uh, Saskatchewan Federal Penitentiary now. So shortly after his conviction in 2011, the actor who plays Dexter Morgan on the show Dexter uh, came forward, and Michael C. Hall basically just stated that he would like to think that even without the show that Twitchell would have committed the crimes anyways, but he knows that Dexter had something to do with it, and that thought is truly horrifying. So that is the end of today's story. If you liked what you heard, then don't forget to subscribe and comment down below on what you thought of this story. Don't forget I post every Monday, and if you have a story that you'd like me to cover, then comment down below, and it could be featured on next week's Canadian Murder Mystery. Thank you for watching, and have a great day.